uh, let me um, ask you just one or two things uh, about the, uh, the talk you're giving here. You're, you're talking about targeted therapy now. You know, some people think targets, that's exoset, and that's missiles and all that. So tell us about targeted therapy. Actually, you're not, breast cancer really is. you're not far off the mark, really. I mean, targeted therapy is what the, um, the public think of as the magic bullet for cancer. And basically, you've got two ways of attacking a cancer cell in a targeted way. You can either make an antibody that sticks onto it and gums it up and destroys it, or you can find a target inside the cell and get a little molecule to get inside the cell and destroy it like that. So it's really exploiting the differences between normal cells and cancer cells and making the therapy more specific so it kills the cancer cell without so much collateral damage. So the magic bullet isn't a bad idea. So is, uh, what's this dual stuff you're talking about, dual targeting? Is that, is that two exocet missiles hitting two different targets or is it one exocet missile that hits two targets? What? Dual targeting is two exocet missiles hitting two parts of the same target because we know if we just use one uh, antibody in this case, sometimes that um, works in a large percentage of patients but can stop working because the cells can find a way around it. So if you hit it in two ways at the same time, you get a better result both in terms of a higher hit rate and a longer result. So in breast cancer you're talking about which target? Um, in breast cancer I'm talking about the HER2. HER2 receptor. And the HER2 receptor can be targeted by an antibody and that's trastuzumab? There's two ways of targeting the HER2 receptor. This is a protein that's overexpressed in about 25% of breast cancers and it confers a bad prognosis. It's been revolutionized by targeted treatment. There's two ways of doing it. One with antibody treatment and the first in class is a drug called trastuzumab, otherwise known as Herceptin. And then the other approach inside the cell is to use a small molecule to destroy the enzymes inside the cell. And there's a drug called lapatinib that does that. And they don't work in an identical fashion, and they are not totally cross-resistant, is that right? They don't work in an identical fashion. One works outside the cell um, and prevents intercellular pathways, and the other works inside the cell. Uh, they're not totally cross-resistant. There's the potential to combine them. And indeed, in one of the recent American meetings, there was quite a lot of interest in that as a concept for dual-targeted mm. therapy. Mm. Yeah. Side effects? What's what the patient always wants to know? Side effects and the yes. Well, we have to manage the side effects and try and prevent them. With antibodies, because they're humanized, if we just took an antibody and put it into somebody, they'd get a reaction because antibodies are made out of mouse proteins. But they're humanized, so the body doesn't see them as foreign. So some people get an infusion reaction where they feel a bit shivery the day they have the antibody, but generally they're very well tolerated, although you can get unexpected side effects. So you do have to monitor them quite carefully in clinical trials. Um, the other molecules are what we call the tyrosine kinase inhibitors, which are the ones that get inside the cell. Um, they tend to have side effects that often affect the gut, so people get, tend to get diarrhea with them and can get skin rashes. These can be difficult to manage for some patients, but they're anticipatable, so they're manageable. They're much easier to give than chemotherapy, well, and probably easier for the patients. I think that almost certainly. Uh, easier for the patient. The, 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 the downside, of course, is that a bit, a bit like um, the estrogen therapy, tamoxifen, in, in, in women who've got a positive breast cancer with, for estrogen receptor, you don't get a 100% response. And you don't also with the HER2-new. You can see the HER2-new overexpressed, uh, and you say, oh, the, the antibody or the small molecule is going to do the trick. It doesn't get 100%. So what's going on there, do you think? You're absolutely right. I mean, if we had 100%, I'd be out of a job, and wouldn't that be nice? Um, there's two things. You, the, the cells can be resistant to the antibody um, up front, or they can develop resistance. Clearly, the cancer cells are trying to grow, so even if you're continually giving a therapy, the cancer cell will find another pathway to bypass it. So they can switch on other receptors, or they can switch off receptors, and there's a couple of the mechanisms whereby they can become resistant. Where's your money? Where's my money? Mm -hmm. On which uh, bypass mechanism? Um, I've, well, for Herceptin, I think there's two predominant ones. Um, up front, about 20-30% of the patients don't have an intact receptor, which means if the bit of the receptor isn't sitting there on the cell, then the Herceptin can't bind to it. And that's probably accounts for quite a lot of primary resistance. The secondary resistance, uh, it's probably to do with the intracellular signaling and the 
main candidate pathway is something called the P10 pathway. Okay. Which can platinum? be switched off and then the cells become and resistant. And the resistant. Well, lapatinib, um, obviously, uh, lapatinib works inside the cell, so it's going to not affect um, the, the, when, well, it's not going to affect all the pathways, but if it's working inside the cell, then if the um, protein isn't intact and there isn't an extracellular bit, the only way you can hit the receptor is with inside the cell. Mm -hmm. So that would be one area in which it'd be particularly useful. What are the next questions in that whole area? What are we going to do now? Um, next questions are probably dual targeting or even triple targeting looking at other targets. Um, obviously, there's a lot of other proteins implicated in a breast cancer growth. And then even more clever molecules, for example, combining um, drugs to some of the antibodies so that they're released inside the cell. Uh, so that, that's looking a promising approach. Okay. Thanks very much for that. Now, Alison, I'm just going to ask you a few questions about HCA. Alison, you work at HCA and see patients there. What sort of cancer services do you provide there? We provide comprehensive cancer services at HCA. It's a family of hospitals um, across London um, and indeed around Greater London and the UK. And within the, the, the service, there are hospitals that specialise in different areas. Mm -hmm. So there's comprehensive surgical cover and there's a cancer-specific hospital in the centre of London. And you're networking, I'm told, and yes. you know, why is that all working out? I think people have a perception that, that private health care is very individualistic, and it, it shouldn't be. It should follow the same paradigms that, you know, indeed we'd recognise for all of cancer care, where people work in teams. Now, within the private sector, sometimes the teams are more diffuse because you'll be working for different people across different institutions. But it should be subject to the same governance in terms of guidelines, agreed protocols, audit, update and team working. Um, so that's being increasingly set up. So we have multidisciplinary meetings to discuss cases. We formulate agreed guidelines that we work to. Uh, we facilitate the introduction of new treatments. So if I find something new that's worth doing, then everybody else can get the benefit of it. Um, and so we're functioning in teams. Audit? Audit, yes, we do mm -hmm. audit. Mm -hmm. Clinical trials? Now that's an interesting question. Um, clinical trials are just being set up. HCA's mm -hmm. taken a stance in doing that. They've employed a research team and we've just started some clinical trial work. HCA in America are uh, really one of the biggest providers of patients for clinical trials. They have a network of, I don't remember how many hospitals, but they, they, they really make an impression on clinical research and they move uh, trials along very quickly. And it seems logical to develop that also in the HCA hospitals here. I think I agree with you, Gordon. I mean, it would be good to have the clinical trial activity going on in the private sector. Obviously, HCA in the UK has the advantage of the American experience and hopefully it'll, it will take off well. Good luck. Thanks Thank very you. much indeed. Pleasure.